Well, praise the Lord. What a good time in God's presence today. Amen. Amen. So I'm believing that maybe many of you today already received a touch from the Lord during that time. Right? We prayed for needs physically. Receiving the Lord, I believe God's doing a great work right now. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I believe, I believe that other people need to know what God's doing. And Ricky said it, testify, right? We need to testify to that. And I remember some weeks back we had um, a guest uh, speaker that came. His name was James Dodd, and he uh, was a missionary to Belize. And anybody remember him coming and being here? And uh, he shared with us that day. And, and uh, actually, that day we increased our, uh, our giving uh, over our tithes and offerings to missions. We doubled what we uh, had done. And so we were able to add nine new missionaries that we support. And uh, so God just blessed us that day. But I remember one thing he said. He may have said somebody else may have said this, and he was quoting it from them but uh, he said something to the effect of build relationships and tell your story. You remember that? Build relationships with people with an intention to tell what God has done. In other words, when you tell your story, you're, telling, you're giving a testimony to what the Lord has done. And uh, uh, about a week and a half ago, I, well, I, I've been visiting a, a new little place frequently where I get a cup of coffee and some things like that. And, I, and, uh, and so recently, uh, myself and the pastoral staff have met there a couple of times uh, and, and had some coffee and some things like that and had our meetings there. And uh, I know that people in there were listening. They, they, it's not like going in some places where they blast music really loud. The music is there, but it's really in the background. And so... I, I think everybody could hear us and what we were talking about, which was okay with us. And, uh, and uh, one time after, after this, we were getting ready to leave, and a young man in there uh, said, can I ask you a, a, a question? He said, it, it's kind of, I forget how he worded it. It's kind of a crazy request or something like that. And I said, sure. He said, would you pray for me? And... Uh, and the time before I had gone in, they were asking about, they, I guess from hearing us, they had found out that we were at a church. Where's the church? What's the church about? Those kind of things. And so we had already kind of had that conversation. He said, would you pray for me? And I said, sure. What do you need prayer for? He said, since we moved here just a little while ago, he said, our car has gone out and we need a car. Uh, really bad. I'm having a hard time finding one. And maybe it's because finding one in his price range, whatever the situation was. I was gonna I was gonna say let's pray right now because that's the way I like to do it but somebody else came up and ordered something and then then that just continued to happen and I didn't get an opportunity to right then but I but I pointed at him as he was waiting on somebody else and said I'm gonna be praying for you <laughs> and uh, I'm, ex I'm gonna expect uh, something to happen and uh, and so I pulled out uh, I carry in my wallet some of the cards anybody see see some of the new we would call them sometimes business cards. I like to call them invite cards that are out in the foyer. There's a bunch of them out there on that little black, little sh narrow welcome desk when you come in. And uh, I handed him one of those, and I actually told him, I said, there's a phone number on here to the church, but you can, you can call that number, and it'll give you a menu of who you could get in touch with. And if you need, if you need to call me, just listen for Pastor Greg, and you can press that, that number. I said, it'll ring my phone directly. And you can call me. I'll, I'll be there and I'll pray, I'll pray with you about anything. So, uh, so I'm expecting when I go back, God to have done something. <laughs> you know, in some way, in some form. And to be able to say, you know what, that's because the Lord loves you. And he's got a great plan for your life. He wants to work in your life. And, and, uh, and, uh, and so I'm going to invite him to come, come to church. But I, wanna, I, want to, I want to encourage you to do the same kind of thing. And, uh, and, and I want to help. I want to have the ushers come and help me with this. Um, I've, got, I've got some invite cards for you. Not for you to have, but for you to share. <laughs> All right, so if you, if you op open that up, there's, there's, they're in sets of five, okay? And so um, now, uh, question for you. If we give these to you, will you give them out? 
okay? They do no good laying in your car dash <laughs> or, <laughs> or staying in your pocket, right? I mean, look for an opportunity. Work, look for opportunities to have a conversation and be able to say something about the Lord and hand them a card, okay? And, uh, and so if, if, you will, if you will do that, I want you to raise your hand, and I want the ushers to hand out a card to everyone that's got their hands raised today that you'll do that. Now, guys, if you happen to run out, I can't remember how many is in each one. Uh, I got another box of them up here, okay? Uh, hey, George, I'm going to recruit you as, as an as, as a usher for the day. Will you hand out some? <laughs> George, is, George, he's always willing to help. So thank you for that. All right. All right. Great. God, it, it, I believe if we pray for and we look for opportunities, God provides them. Amen. Amen. If there's somebody watching online right now and you want some, contact me. All right. <laughs> contact us. We'll make sure you get some too to hand out to some people when, uh, when you go around town as well. All right. All right. And so I want to do one more thing with that and then we're going to get into the word today. Okay. We got, we got two right here in the middle. They've got their hands raised. They want a card. Oh, three right there. All on the same row. All right. All right, anybody? Anybody else? All right, we served everybody. All right. And so the, the main thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, you guys can put them right there. Hey, at the end, if, uh, if, if, you, wanna, if you want another one, you think you're going to give out that many, then come. There's still plenty here, okay? All right. All right, here's what I want to do now, and then we'll be finished with this part. I want us to pray for opportunities to be able to share the Lord because the main thing we want to do is share Jesus with people, right? But we also want to invite them to a place where they can be discipled and grow in the Lord. Amen? So I want to pray for opportunities. So will you join with me and you pray? As I pray, you pray for you to have opportunities to be able to share the truth of the gospel with somebody. Can we do that? Father God, in the name of Jesus, we pray, Lord, even today, even later on today, if we go to the store or we go out to eat or wherever, Lord, opportunities to be able to share our story with somebody. Lord, as we get into a conversation, Lord, lead that conversation, Lord, to be able, Lord, to share the truth somehow with, with someone, to be able to show them the love of God, the power of God, and even be able to tell our testimony in some form, in some way, so that we can also hand them a card and say, you know what, there's a group of people that will love you, care for you, and help you grow in your relationship with God. And so, Lord, we thank you for that today. We give you all the praise, and we give you all the glory for it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. All right, I expect some testimonies to come out of that. All right, who's ready for the word? Amen. Amen. I thought I'd say it a little bit do today see who would still get excited about it all right all right all right we have a we're starting a series today um called we are family here and we mean that here and we mean that in your family all right we're family here and uh, and so we're going to talk on family issues family situations and those kind of things today we're starting out talking about straight talk on marriage and singleness okay married and single, okay? And uh, we've got a, a couple of couples that, uh, that gave some answers to some questions about marriage, and we're going to show that video right now that Karina made. Marriage for me is a marriage to my best friend, um, honoring him in his decision making. Two people coming together as one. Two separate people compromising, sharing their life together, uniting, living their life together. All of that I agree with. Um, the idea I think is that if you share everything that you have and you do everything that make every effort to make sure that the other person is happy with you and that you take care of them when they need help and you don't tr you don't try to anger them of course because that's a bad deal but <laughs> yeah but uh, yeah you you try to live a good decent life with 
and respect the person you're with and uh, make their life as comfortable as you can. So marriage to me is the covenant between Christ and the church. Marriage to me means that we get to take part in a covenant that symbolizes the walk that we have with Christ and how much love he has for the church and vice versa, the church should love Christ. And I think that marriage gives you an opportunity to love someone unconditionally, um, to, to share your experiences with them, your highs and lows, um, just like it says in the vows, you know, for better, for, for worse, uh, rich or poor, sickness and health. That kind of loyalty is hard to find nowadays. A lot. A lot. <laughs> well, I've learned it's best if you, if you uh, share everything, literally, work and everything around the house and things like that. And also, you have to express your feelings or it can turn into a disaster if you're trying to to uh, guess what somebody is thinking. Learning to die to self again is another. And preferring your spouse over yourself. <laughs> well, uh, you know, where do you want to start? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you do learn a lot because uh, you're, you're learning your significant other. Someone once told me once that if you want to find out uh, how selfish you are, get married. And so if you want to find out how really how selfish you are, have kids. <laughs> uh, it really points out to you that you have to start thinking about other people. You know, I've heard it said before that you're getting a, a high school diploma and a college degree, associates, a master's, and you continue to grow in your education on the other person. So you continue to learn the things they like and don't like. I learned it's not about me. Like he said, it's about making the other person happy. Um, not all about what you want, what you want to do. It's a lot of compromise. Well, first of all, you hit this. You have to take this very seriously. This isn't something that that you can rush off and do it at the drop of a hat, because at that time you feel like you want to get married or you should be married or whatever. That's not the way to do it. You have to know well ahead of time what you're getting into because it's not that easy. Don't settle. Don't settle. Don't settle for anything less than God's best. It's out there. Prepare yourself in the waiting. You know, he tells us to watch and pray, but you prepare <laughs> yourself in the waiting time. And make sure you guard your own heart. Um, a lot of times when we get emotional and we want to try to make something happen, you know, the Bible says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing, not she who stops or, <laughs> or tries to make it happen. I heard it say one time that you need to be so close to God that when the person that's going to marry you finds you, they find God as well. Don't expect perfection. Nobody's nope. perfect. Nobody. So don't expect that perfect fairy tale movie <laughs> love because that's not real. God's best is perfect for you. And I'm, I'm just grateful to God that I get to do life with my best friend. Yeah. <laughs> that. <laughs> what they said. <laughs> There, there is a lot to learn, isn't there? Um, and, and the Bible does say, does say a lot about marriage. And, and it talks about being single, too. You know, let's, let's talk about being single for just a minute. Because I, I want to do this more, a little bit more. Although, maybe we're not going to go back and forth really that, really that much today. But more conversational uh, in what we're talking about today. First of all, I believe, I believe most Christians... Don't subscribe to the legitimacy of singleness. Okay? 
remember Paul the Apostle was single his whole life. Uh, and I, I, think he, I think he lived a fulfilled life, do you? Many times we make people feel less than if they're not married. Directly or indirectly, subtly or not so subtly, we sign on to the conviction that sometimes people that are single are just unfinished business. And we say things like this, either in groups or private conversations, you know, you aren't married yet? You know, what's going on? You know, what's a nice girl like you doing unmarried? You know, what you need is a good wife, right? And maybe what they really need is Jesus. <laughs> and so, so we, we treat singleness, I believe, wrongly many times. Um, I, I, believe, I believe God will lead you to someone that, that, that you need. Um, but God is first and foremostly concerned about your soul. And so as we start out the series, uh, we're family here. We're going to start out talking on, of all things, singleness, and then move into marriage, both of them today. And uh, so let's jump, let's jump right in. All right, I have, I have three straight talking points I'm going to present to you today. You ready? All right, straight talk number one. Marriage doesn't complete you. Jesus completes you. Okay? If you're looking for somebody else to totally fulfill you, I'm here today to tell you that they will let you down. Okay? God can bless you with someone that can be a part of helping to fulfill you, but they in themselves can't fulfill you because they're just another human being like you who is flawed and makes mistakes. Do we have any people in the room that are flawed and make mistakes? All right, I'll pray for those that did not raise their hand today to come to an understanding of the truth. All right. <laughs> so marriage doesn't complete you. Jesus completes you, okay? You are complete in him, right? That's Colossians 2, 9 and 10. It says, for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. All right, this translation says, so you are complete through your union with Christ. Or another translation says, you are complete in him, right? Nothing else completes you outside of Christ. No one else completes you outside of Christ. You are complete in Him. Amen? And so if you're single today, you find your identity in Christ alone. Actually, if you're married today, you find your identity in Christ. Because Jesus said one time when they were asking Him about marriage and, and, and heaven and stuff like that, He actually said... There is no marriage in heaven, right? All right, so when we get to heaven, it's, it's not going to be about who's, who's married. It's really all going to be about Jesus. And so if your relationship with him is not what it should have been or needed to be, that's what's most important, all right? See, marriage is not entered into so that you and I can be fulfilled. Marriage is entered into so... You can help bless. See, it's like, I think, I think Crystal said this in the, in the video, right? That I, f I found out it's not about me. <laughs> it's not about getting my needs met. It's about helping meet the needs of the one that I'm married to, right? But, but guess what? If both spouses have that same desire to meet the other one's needs, guess what? You'll be fulfilled too, right? And so if you're single, that's, that's the kind of person you need to look for. Okay, we'll talk more about that in just a minute. But when a married couple wants to do life this way, all right, the Lord is number one. You know, I've told, I've told Lisa over the years, and she hasn't, she hasn't gotten upset at me for saying this, right? After Jesus, you're the best thing that's ever happened to me, <laughs> right? Because he's, he's first. If, if I don't love him the way I need to love him, I cannot love her the way I need to love her. And so when a married couple enters into a relationship like that, they're both fulfilled. I, I saw this quote by Tim Keller. I, I loved it. It, say, it says this, and you might say, well, what in the world does this have to do with marriage? I'll tell you. Glad you asked. <clears throat> the gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe, yet at the very same time we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. 
See, that's the way we need to love our mate. All right? To, to, to have this God-directed, this, this kind of love, to love and to care for an imperfect husband or wife more than they ever dared to expect or hope for. So, as a single person, how should you prepare for this? Okay? First, become the kind of person that you're looking for. Right? If you're looking for, a, uh, if you're looking for someone who loves the Lord with all their heart and will take care of you and will love you and stand beside you and go to church with you, then don't marry somebody that goes to the bar every Saturday night and leaves at 2 a.m. in the morning and never goes to church and say that you want to marry him because he's funny. I'm telling you, after a while, it won't be funny anymore. <laughs> All right? <laughs> it won't be too funny. Practice, though, being the kind of person. Guess what? I was attracted to Lisa because she was the kind of person that I, I, I wanted to be be with because we had the same values we believe the same things those are the kind of things that you that you look for and at the same time be the person that you want to attract because they'll be attracted they will be attracted to you guess guess what if if you're living a, a, a lifestyle over here and you want a person like this over here you won't be attracting them when you're living this lifestyle over here they will never come around you because they don't want to live that life be the person that you want to attract Okay, so, you know what? The, I, let me give you some words, I think, that go with that. Practice being loving, kind, patient, good, joy-filled, self-controlled. Wait a minute, that's the fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> right? The Bible says if you'll walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Right? You won't live the kind of life that, that will attract somebody that you don't really want. So then determine to love and fulfill that future spouse with all that you are. Again, marriage doesn't complete you. Jesus is the one that completes you. And when you're complete in him, you don't have to have someone else to complete you. I've seen people in the past so desperate to have someone that they'll grab at anybody that comes along and gives them attention and then they're miserable. If you bind yourself to someone, and that's what you do when you get married. You're, you're binding yourself to them. You bind yourself to someone in marriage, to someone who doesn't have the interest in the things that you do. They will pull you or try to pull you away from your completeness in Christ. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says it like this, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? And that can be applied to any situation in our life, but definitely applies to marriage. In other words, don't bind yourself to someone that doesn't believe like you do. It doesn't matter how beautiful they are, how handsome they are, how witty. I mentioned funny. You know, that's what's said a lot. Oh, they got a great sense of humor. I just love that, right? It doesn't matter how rich they are. If they don't value what you'd value, if they don't care about living for the Lord, if they don't love your Jesus, you're going to be miserable no matter how sexy they are. <laughs> okay? Can we just be honest here today? Yeah. Right? Because that, that wears off after a while. I mean, hey, haven't you seen the sexiest people in Hollywood get married sometimes? And then a year or two later, they're divorced? That's not what does it, right? I mean, it, it, is the, it is that natural physical attraction that we have maybe initially to begin with that attracts us to someone when we maybe don't know them or don't know their personality yet. Um, you know, that's a part of how God designed us to be a, attracted to someone by their looks or whatever. And God designed that to go further, yes, sex, Right? Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4 says, Honor marriage and guard the sacredness of sexual intimacy between wife and husband. And then it says, But God draws a firm line against casual and illicit sex. 
The King James Version says that the marriage bed is sacred. And adulterers and fornicators, God will judge. Separated from marriage, sex winds up destroying people. And that's why if you're single, you don't need to be going out and having sex with just whoever will do it with you. There's a hormone that is that's produced in the brain. It's the same one when a mother breastfe- breastfeeds her baby. I'm trying to remember the name of it. Oxytocin, thank you. So, and it's also the same one that is secreted when people have sex. And, and emotionally, it, it, it connects people. It's like, a, it's like a, an emotional glue. So that's what happens, mothers, when, <laughs> when you breastfeed your baby. I'm not trying to be graphic. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to tell how God created us here today, okay? And it, it bonds that mother and child together. It's the same thing between husband and wife, though. Or anyone is trying to bond you together. And when you go and you have multiple partners over a period of time and over a period of years, you're sticking and pulling apart, sticking and pulling apart, sticking and pulling apart until after a while you have a hard time sticking. And when you get married, that part is not as good. Because you've stuck and unstuck, stuck and unstuck, stuck and unstuck till. It's hard to even trust somebody because they've been with multiple people, you've been with multiple people, and maybe you married somebody that, that that's been the case. You came to the Lord. The Lord can heal all that, praise the Lord. Okay? But I'm just telling you how God made us. Separated from marriage, sex winds up destroying people. Every form, every viewing of sexual visuals that you could have, I'm talking pornography, every single manner of sexual expression outside of a married man and a married woman winds up harming and eventually wrecking people's lives. And so God doesn't tell you to wait until marriage to ruin your fun. He tells you to wait until marriage so that you can have the most fun. Sex is like a fire. Outside of the fireplace, it can burn the house down. But inside the fireplace, it keeps the house warm. Here's the sexual message of the Bible. Keep the fire within the marital fireplace and stoke that fire as hot as you can. (laughs) I can't believe, I can't believe Pastor Greg's talking about that stuff here today. But it would be better to stay single your whole life than to marry someone who is either going to pull you away from God or try to do that because they're going in a different direction anyway and, and, and going to make your life miserable because they don't care about what your main focus in life is. That's Jesus. But if you do marry, make sure that you marry someone who will love Jesus more than you. a good thing to love Jesus the most and love you second with the same kind of love remember marriage doesn't complete you Jesus completes you all right there's you some straight talk can you handle another one straight talk number two married people never fall out of love they just lose their focus married people never fall out of love they just lose their focus so For both married and single people, keep your focus on the Lord. If you're married, or when you get married, keep your focus on the Lord and on your marriage in the Lord. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 to 6. He said, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female. Let me stop there for a minute. Let me give you another little straight shooting. Okay? What did he make them? There is nothing else. I don't care how, how you feel. <laughs> doesn't matter how you feel. <laughs> this is how God made us. 
this is what the Word of God says. If we can't believe the whole Word of God, we might as well believe nothing of the Word of God. But if we're going to believe the Word of God, we need to believe what it says. And it says, in, and Jesus said this, and he was actually quoting the Old Testament. Okay, so now he's repeating what God has already said, and here's God that came in the flesh to say it again. I said, here's God in the flesh saying it again. Uh, he didn't just say it once, he said it multiple times. He said he made them what? Male and female. There is nothing else. And then he said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united or cleave unto his wife, and the two will become one flesh. You know, he's quoting another passage in the Old Testament again, right? For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united or cleave to his wife. A man is to cleave unto his wife, male and female, right? The only options, according to Scripture. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one or no man separate. All right? So, so here's another thing I see in this passage right here. This passage, if you read the context of it, now we read verses 4 to 6, but I think it's in verse 3. Actually, he was responding to a question. If you look at it, it says, Jesus said, haven't you read? He replied. He was replying to a question. Actually, the Pharisees were trying to trick him again. I don't know why they didn't give up after a while, because it never worked. <laughs> right? But they were trying to test him, I think it says. And, and they were saying, is it legal for uh, a man to divorce his, his wife for any reason? And, and so this was his reply. Creator made a male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united, or cleave to his wife. Two will become one flesh. And what God has joined together, let no one separate he was talking about divorce actually was what he was talking about by talking about what marriage should be okay and so he was answering a question about divorce what god has joined let no one separate is about not divorcing and then he goes on to say after the passage that we read but just the next verse or two he goes on to say that that adultery or mar marital infidelity is a, the reason for divorce Okay, I will say, I'll, I'll uh, step out on another limb here, <clears throat> and I'll say I also believe that if your life or the life of your children is in danger, you need to at the very least be separated from that person, okay? I don't believe that we need to tolerate abuse uh, that, of that kind, all right? So, but you may have gone through a divorce, that maybe in your past that wasn't for a biblical reason, or maybe it was. I know that there's people in all different areas of this in the room and people that are listening online, but, but maybe you did go through a divorce that wasn't for a biblical reason. But you know, just like anything else, there is forgiveness from the Lord for anything <laughs> that we do that's, that's not according to His will. Most of the time, though, divorce happens because of a lack of focus, and that's what I want to get to in this, in this piece, this straight talk piece. You know that anything that you do that you lose your focus on will fall apart? You know, if I choose to text and drive and run off the road and crash my car, I cannot blame my car for it, right? It's my fault for not paying attention and losing my focus. And that's what happens in our marriage sometimes is after a while, we begin to lose our focus on them and what we should be doing for them. And we get them on so many other things. We, we see things that sometimes, listen, sometimes they can be good things. But if you're doing good things and you wind up losing God's best things, sometimes we can do good things that's not a God thing. We need to focus. We, if we're married, we need to focus on our marriage because that relationship, marriage, is like Christ in the church, Ephesians chapter 5 tells us. 
And we're an example to the world of Christ and the church when we're married. And so if we don't give a lot of attention to our marriage, keep our focus on our marriage, then we're not a good example of Christ and the church no matter what else we do. So focus. Focus is what keeps you on track. It keeps you in joy. It keeps you full of passion. I say this a lot of times. People come and they, they ask questions about marriage or they have some mar- marital issues. And whoever it is that I'm talking to, and normally it's me talking to the guys. Lisa talks to the ladies, but I'll talk directly with the guys. And I'll say, listen, you know, sometimes it's like, yeah, but you don't know what she's like. <laughs> you don't know what she's done. You don't know, you know. It's like, no, I don't. And I don't even need you to tell me all of that. <laughs> Here, here's, what we, here's what you and I need to do. You and I need to work on you. All right? Oh, I've seen it over and over again. I mean, you may not believe it's really possible, but it works this way. I, and I'll say it. I guarantee if, if we'll work on you and get you where you need to be, a lot of what's going on with her will be fixed. And we could say the same thing if we're talking to the lady, okay? Focus on you, okay? Be be the person that God wants you to be. And if you'll do that, if you'll fulfill your role in Scripture as a husband or as a wife, and you'll, you'll walk in it and you'll love them with all of your heart, you'll care for them, you'll respect them, man... It creates, listen, listen, you got to get this. It creates an automatic response in them. They don't have to think, well, let's see, what is it I'm supposed to be doing? It's like an automatic thing. Come on, guys, you know how it's like. You do something for your wife that you know that maybe, sometimes, I, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm not trying to stay on this, but sometimes, guys, the sexiest thing you can do is wash the dishes, okay? All right? Sweep the floor. You know, I mean, do something that she knows you don't like to do, but you're doing it for her, <laughs> right? If you'll do, it's like, it's like the, <laughs> thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that confirmation. I mean, I mean, it could just, I mean, it could just make her all lovey-dovey towards you, you know, because, you know. Um, because you, you did something for her, she, she understands that that's not your thing, okay? But, but your focus is on her. So whatever that looks like for her. For her, it may not be, for your wife, it may not be that, okay? It may be something else, but you, you should know what it is, right? You need to get that degree that Dylan was talking about, okay? You need to study her enough that you know, right? You know what her love language is, Okay? So focus on, focus on fixing you, not fixing them, okay? Focus on your part in the relationship. If you'll focus on you loving, respecting, caring, staying in your role, keeping your responsibilities, feelings will follow. Yeah, but I just don't feel it anymore. I just don't, I don't feel that love anymore. Feelings are fleeting. Feelings change from day to day, whatever, you know? I mean, some days I wake up, I don't even like me. You know? <laughs> I don't even like myself. I'm not going to divorce myself. I, I need myself. But... <laughs> and you need your spouse. <laughs> right? So, so it's not about feelings... What does God say? Who, who does God say you're supposed to be? You be who you're supposed to be. I guarantee you feelings will follow. Anybody remember the time I did the little illustration of the train? Our life is like a train. And many people try to put their feelings as the engine on the train. Well, you're going to wreck before you get 50 yards down the track. Like that, because my feelings are all over the map sometimes. Feelings can't be the engine on you. Put, make it the caboose on the train, Right? Put truth as the engine that drives your train. I'm going to live according to the truth of the word of God, no matter how I feel. Guess what? Your feelings will come into the line because wherever that train goes, I don't care if you're the last car on the train, your feelings are here, they'll eventually come into alignment. Two, that's the way it works. It's the way it works. So, try it. It's amazing. 
try it, okay? Lisa and I are going to talk more about this and marriage in general at our Marriage by the Book workshop coming up in July, okay? So we'll give you the dates and everything coming up soon, okay? So joy in marriage is not in finding the right person. Joy in marriage is being the right person. Some of you aren't sure about that. I guarantee you, if you'll be the right person, again, you'll get some automatic responses from them. Being attractive is being who you should be in Christ. I don't know about you. I've known people that I've met or whatever, and they're just like this. this they're just like beautiful people. Just you know, I mean, you know, I mean, they're just beautiful people. You know, like. God spent a lot of time shaping them and, you know, working on them and whatever, you know. And their face is symmetrical and, you know, all these things, you know. I'm just. But, but then you get to know them. And you're like, God, oh, that's an ugly person. <laughs> I mean, naturally, they could be beautiful. In reality, though, they're not that beautiful, right? And you don't see them that way once you get to know them. Come on, somebody know what I'm talking about? I'm just kind of being honest here today, Right? See, being attractive is being who you should be in Christ. Jesus is the most beautiful. And if I'm, if I'm being conformed into him, his image and I'm looking like him, and I'm in my actions, and I, you know, I can look like this and still be beautiful. <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thank you, Justin. Thank you for that affirmation and confirmation. <laughs> you, got, you guys know Matthew 6, I'm pretty sure. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, right? And all these other things will be added to you as well. When we put him first, it's amazing how other things fall into place. Be, become, become more like him. Married people don't fall out of love. They just lose focus. Focusing on first things first causes other things to come into alignment. That's what Matthew 6, 33 is about, whether, whether we apply it to marriage or anything else in our life. I think about Jesus when I think about this. He said, seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these other things will be given to you as well, right? But that's how Jesus lived. He didn't come to this earth to do something for himself. He already had it all when he was with the Father in heaven, right? He came to do something for us. So his whole life was spent focusing on not doing anything for himself, but doing everything for us, right? He came to do something for his bride. And he had to focus on first things first. And he kept his eye on the prize for the joy that was set before him. The Bible says he endured the shame and the suffering and the pain. And when Jesus looked down from the cross, he did, I don't think he thought, I'm giving myself to you because you're so attractive to me. Because sin is ugly, right? And we've all, and we've all been in sin. And we had to have the cleansing that the blood did for us. So when he looked down to us, I don't think, I don't, he was in agony. When he looked down from us, to us from the cross, and he looked down at us as we were denying him and abandoning him and betraying him, and in the greatest act of love in history, he stayed on the cross. He stayed. He could have left. He could have taken himself down. He could have called the angels to take him down, but he didn't. He stayed. That's the greatest act of love ever. He gave his life for us. Jesus loved us, not because we were perfect, but because he wanted to perfect us. And so, when you have, when you, when you have the Lord in your life, he's the one that keeps your love tank full. Okay? So I want you to get this, okay? When you have your God love tank full, Another person can't empty you of your love toward them. <laughs> when you have your God love tank full, another person can't empty you 
of your love toward them. I just don't love them anymore. You must not have your God love tank full. Because Jesus said, love your enemies. Love your what? I don't think I heard you right, Jesus. <laughs> love your enemies. If you can love your enemies because of the love of God that he's placed in your heart and how he's loved you, you can surely love your spouse. But it, all this takes is just a little bit of logic. <laughs> when you know the scripture, right? Keep focused on love. Keep focused on his love. It'll carry you through. He never said you wouldn't go through hard times together. But he said it would carry you through. Married people don't fall out of love. They lose their focus. I always, I always wondered, I, I'm, I'm taking one quick rabbit trail and then I'll be on the last point. You ready? Okay, just a little. It'll come back. Okay. Falling in and out of love. It's like, what, is, what do you think love is? A hole? <laughs> I'm trapped and I can't get out. <laughs> Let me out of here. <laughs> All right, I'm done. I'm back. <laughs> I'll let you come up with an answer for that one. Okay. All right. Straight talk number three. Marriage is primarily about friendship and partnership. Genesis 2, chapter 18, this is from the Amplified. It says, Now the Lord God said, It is not good, beneficial, for the man to be alone. I will make a helper, one who balances him, a counterpart who is suitable and complementary for him. First, it's not good. You know, before this not good, everything that God did, he said it was good. It's good, it's good. Everything he made, it's good, it's good, it's good. And then all of a sudden, now the Lord God said, it's not good for a man to be alone. Now it's not good for women to be alone either, but I don't know, something about men. I don't know. We get in trouble when we're alone. <laughs> Big Big kids. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I need my wife sometimes to tell them. You know, somebody one time said, said the voice of God many times sounds, sounds like amazing like, like the voice of my wife. <laughs> you know you shouldn't do that. <laughs> we need to turn the channel. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking that was getting a little bad there. <laughs> Thank you for mentioning it. <laughs> Come on, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> it is not good for the man to be alone. <laughs> it was not good for him to be alone. He needed something. Even better than that, he needed someone. Notice the first thing God mentioned about him making a wife for him. But this is what he was getting ready to do, right? Was that he needed a helper, right? He needed a, a friend that would balance him, okay? He needed one, one word that is used here in the Amplified to further describe that helper is counterpart, all right? Counterpart, it means a corresponding piece, right? A different but equivalent part, an opposite but matching piece. One who comes alongside and aids just where you need it. Like, like where I really fail, Lisa is really good. And so instead of me saying, I'm the man, I'm going to make those decisions. <laughs> well, I, well, I used to be that way. That's why I know about that. I've come to the point that I'm, I like realize, you know what? You really see better in this area. You know better in this area. What do you think? Tell me. 
And then sometimes she gets upset at me because I, I start acting on what she says right away. I can't understand this. And I didn't tell her. That's how we were going to do it. What are you doing? We talked about this yesterday, and you said, and so I'm doing it. <laughs> but you didn't tell me. <laughs> I know. I, just, I, I can't get it right. <laughs> Trying to try. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we, have, we have a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun. <clears throat> All right, so I was trying to think through this, this counterpart idea, okay? And the best thing I could come up with, maybe you can come up with something better than this. The best thing I could come up with is, is puzzle pieces that fit together, right? Got any people that love to put puzzles together, right? I hate them. <laughs> they drive me crazy. <laughs> I mean, you know, after about six weeks, I just throw it back in the box. Because I, can't, I, can't, I just can't do it. But I do understand <laughs> what, I, what I'm trying to illustrate here about puzzle pieces. They can't look exactly the same and fit together. Where, where this one has an indentation, this one has a piece that fits right in there. You know? It's a counterpart. Right? It goes together, but it's not exactly the same. And what we do is we try to make our spouse exactly like we are. That's a mistake. If they were exactly like you were, they would make all the same mistakes you make, and you'd never get out of the hole that you find yourself in. You need somebody that counters your part. Right? A counterpart. They, they're, they're different, but they fit together perfectly. But these puzzle pieces, though, have the same picture in mind. They're, cry, they're trying to create the same picture. Come on, somebody's got to get this. <laughs> right? They don't have different pictures in mind. They're not trying to create two different pictures of the way life should be they're different but they're putting they're making the same picture those counterpart pieces that we have that are natural and emotional giftings and traits that we have but they're complementary in every way the counterpart all right yeah he's going back there again the counterpart was physically different too Different, opposite, but matching. In other words, Adam needed a woman. Adam didn't need another man for what God was creating for him. Okay? I think you get what I'm saying, don't you? He needed a counterpart. He didn't need the same part. He needed a counterpart. <laughs> so this word that can be translated counterpart or helper is also used of God in the same passage we read at the beginning of the service today except I didn't read down that far Psalm 33 and verse 20 says the Lord he is our help and our shield that word help is the same word that's used as counterpart or helper he's our help He's a, he's a counterpart, right? God being our help or being our counterpart definitely doesn't put him second to us. Ladies, being a helper or a counterpart doesn't put you in second place. Right? You just have a different role to play than the men do, than the husband does. It's just a different role. If we, if we learn our roles, life is wonderful. <laughs> if we learn how God said to do it, life is awesome. It's when we try to do it different than God said to do it that life becomes a mess. So God partners with us. We have our part, and he has his part. God's part is the miraculous. I can't do God's part. And guess what? He won't do my part. <laughs> he waits for us to do our part, and then he shows up with the miraculous and does his part. And as far as husband and wife, neither is better than the other. But we are to be a counterpart. One has certain roles and giftings. The other has complementing 
roles and giftings, but together we're partners in life to accomplish something bigger than both of us. And it is the very purpose and plan for us, for us together that God has. One last scripture. Ephesians 5, 22, and then verse 25. Ephesians 5, 22 says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Oh, he could have gone all day without reading that scripture. But the other one is the counterpart to it. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Guys, if you'll love your wife as Christ loved the church, willing to lay down your life, do anything to make sure she's loved, cared for, cherished, she won't have any problem submitting to you. I heard a lot of women saying that's right, right there. Each of these, as well as the verses in context here in Ephesians 5, give the roles of husband and wives. Again, I'm not trying to make commercials out of this, but Lisa and I are going to talk about these in our Marriage by the Book workshop coming up in July. And I guarantee you that if you arrange yourself in the role that God has placed you in, in marriage, you will be best friends. Friends, counterpart, partners. There's nothing else like it. It's awesome. There's two, there's two parts here to real friendship as we close, okay? Constancy and transparency. Constancy is you're constant. You're just, you're always the same. I, I've asked Lisa several times over the years, wh what, what is it, what is it about me that you kind of like a little bit? And, and, and the thing she says every time is, you're, you're just constant. You're the same everywhere we go. You're the same at home. You're the same at church. You're the same in the store. You're the same, you're the same person everywhere. There's something about that that helps you with your friendship. Is that you know that they're going to be the same. No matter what. Right? And then transparency. You can just be open with them. Without feelings of judgment. Right? Come on. I know how it is. You come home from work or something happens at the store and you're just hopping mad about something. Come on, I know you've been there before. And you just tell them all about it. I can't believe it. And, you know, they did this or whatever. You know, you're just all, all upset, you know. And, you know, and then instead of telling you, well, you shouldn't be like that. You shouldn't feel that way. Oh, guys, never say that to, a, to your wife. You shouldn't feel that way. <laughs> It's never good. <laughs> it's just things not to do, okay? Maybe we can make a list of those. <laughs> That'll be number one. She can't help how she feels. Now, I can make a case for don't act on your feelings all the time, okay? The Bible says be angry and sin not, <laughs> okay? But, you're all upset, you're, you're, you're mad, whatever, and you can pour it out, and your spouse just says, you know what, I, I understand how you feel. That would make me mad too, you know, I would be so upset about it. Once you get it out, after a while you come back and say, I'm sorry I spilled all that on you, <laughs> you know. They didn't say it, but you came back, and, but, but you felt like you could do it with them and just, just, you know, pour it out. There was a writer that once described a relationship with these two things in it, and she said this, this type of relationship, friendship, was like this. And here's a quote. The inexpressible comfort of feeling safe with a person, having neither to weigh thoughts or measure words, but pouring them out, all right out, just as they are, chaff and grain together, certain that a faithful hand will take and sift them, keeping what's worth keeping, and then with the breath of kindness blow the rest away. That type of friendship is an intimate friendship, and it's the kind of friendship we should have as husband and wife. And then it flows into partnership in every area of life where two lives have now become one with one purpose. It becomes strength gained from weakness, making up for each other's flaws. It becomes a threefold cord because 
Jesus is in the middle, right? Becomes a threefold cord that cannot easily be broken. Your lives become so intertwined that they do become one. And isn't that what it's supposed to be? Marriage, a friendship, a partnership with one another in God. That's what he's called it to be. You know, Lisa and I are grateful for both of our parents, our sets of parents, example of marriage and commitment. They both, over the last two months, both of them celebrated, both couples celebrated 57 years of marriage within the last two months. Same, the same number. So, so the year they, they, they both celebrated their 50th, we gave parties for uh, within a month or so of each, each other, 50th anniversary parties. It was, it was awesome. But they're also our role models in that, of friendship, partnership, perseverance, love, care, through all of life's ups and downs. They inspire us to find true joy in the journey of marriage, no matter what comes our way, because they've been through stuff just like all of us have and will. This year, we will be celebrating in September 35 years of marriage. And I'm more in love with Lisa today than I was on that sunny day in 1986. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sweep the floor. <laughs> All right? But those are the kind of things, though, that we do because we love one another. Right? And it draws us closer together. And so I want you to stand with me right now. I want to pray today. I want to pray for marriages today. Strengthening marriages today. I want to pray for I want to pray for singles today. If you're desiring to find someone, then there are things that we've talked about today that you can do to find the right person. But I want to pray today. I believe most people in the room are either probably single or married. <laughs> I, I'm quick that way. So, so I, here's what I want to do. The altar is where you are today because I want to pray for everybody. Okay? If you're with your spouse today, then you can pray with them as with your, for your marriage what's going on. If they happen to not be with you, you can pray that. If you're single, we can pray and believe for God to touch and work in your life today. There's more of these kind of things in the series upcoming, so don't miss, don't miss any of the rest, okay? And don't miss, again, advertisement. Don't miss the Marriage by the Book workshop that we have coming up. I'll give you some specifics on that in just a couple of minutes, but just bow your head for a moment today. And I believe any time the Word of God comes forth that God speaks specific things, individual things, into individual people's lives. And so as God has spoken to you today about something that came out that relates to you, and if, if you are married, can you give that situation to the Lord and pray for yourself in that today if you're single today God gives direction for that as well and God wants to do a work in your life and he wants to lead you to a person that maybe together you can be and become all that God wants you to be and become but you can do it together with someone who compliments you, who's a counterpart to you. And so as I pray, I want you not just to listen to me pray, but I want you to pray too. 
Pray for your situation and where you are and that God will work and bless. So, Lord God, today we come before you. Lord, we thank you today, Lord, that you created this institution called marriage. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that it's a, it's a great thing. Lord, some, some here today are, are not married, not married yet. Maybe they've been married and they're not married now. And Lord, maybe as Paul, there's some, Lord, that maybe from this point forward, you've called them to singleness. And that's okay, too. Lord, when you walked the earth, you never married. <laughs> I, I can't say that you were unfulfilled in what you came to do. You were very fulfilled in what you came to do. You accomplished your Father's will perfectly. And so can we. And so, Lord, today as we come before you, Lord, first of all, we offer ourselves to you. Lord, work in me today. Lord, work in my life and in my heart today. Lord, as a single person or as a married person, work in me. Maybe, maybe myself and my spouse ha is, are having some issues. But Lord, today I'm not looking to him or her. I'm looking to me. Lord, work in me. Lord, change me, mold me, shape me into the man or the woman of God that I need to be so that it, then I can be all that I need to be for them. So, Lord, work in me today. Work in me today. Grow me in you, Lord, I pray. Thank you, Lord. Lord, today I pray, I pray for marriages. I pray for couples today that need strengthening in their marriage. Lord, that you would work, Lord, not only through today's message, but upcoming messages and, and even the workshop, Lord, that's coming up. Lord, that you would use these things and then their efforts to put into practice what your word says, to draw them closer together. Maybe to bring them back to a point that they were before or to bring them to a point that you want them to be. Strengthen them in themselves and in their relationship, Lord, we pray. I pray your blessing and I pray your anointing upon each one in the room today. You know exactly what they need. So Lord, I pray, pour out your spirit upon them. Pour out your anointing upon marriages, upon lives today. Lord, show them, Lord, that nothing is too far gone. Hasn't gone to a point where it cannot be redeemed. You are the Redeemer. And so we praise you for that today. And so, Lord, have your, have your way. Have your way in our lives. Have your way in our homes. Have your way in our marriages. Lord, let us be, in our marriage, let us be the counterpart. We pray today in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. All of a sudden, there she was. So as we close out our time here, there's a couple of needs that were sent in online that I would like to ask you to agree in prayer with us for. And one is uh, Jennifer. Jennifer gave a testimony last week. Uh, Doug, her husband, um, I think he had a, a, yesterday a, like a mini stroke again. And so he's in the hospital today. And so she asked prayer for him. And uh, Allie asked for prayer for uh, her family, that there's a death in the family. And, uh, and, and her dad leaves for rehab tomorrow. So uh, home care. So let's, let's lift these needs before the Lord today. Can we agree together? Father God, we just pray today and we agree together, Lord, for your touch. Lord, we pray for Doug today, Lord, in the hospital right now, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for just, Lord, uh, delivering him from these strokes that he's had, Lord. And, Lord, uh, just erasing the issue and the problem that's causing it. Lord, just lifting him up and bringing healing, Lord, into his body. We agree together for that today. And we speak health. By your stripes, he's healed. And we speak health, Lord, over him today in Jesus' name. 
Lord, we also, Lord, uh, we pray for Allie and her family, Lord. There's been a death in their family, Lord. We pray for comfort for them, Lord, for each one. We pray, Lord, uh, for your Holy Spirit, Lord, that will just be there, Lord, in a time and bring peace. Lord, even, even use, Lord, what's happening, Lord, to draw people to look to you and draw closer to you and her family. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for, for that. So, Lord, just bless them and be with them. We pray, Lord, for, for her dad that is going to, tomorrow for 24-7 home care. We just pray, Lord, for your touch on his life. Lord, it's a, I know it's a, a tough situation, a tough time, but, Lord, you're still there and you're still good. You still have plans. And so, Lord, we pray, Lord, for your touch, Lord, on him. Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray today also for our family, my mom's sister who is um, in hospice care right now. Lord, that you would just touch Bonnie, Lord, today. And you just be with her and bless her. And, and uh, also my mom and, and her, her siblings and other, our other family members, Lord. Just be with them, Lord, during this time. Lord, we pray. Lord, do things, Lord, that people can only point to you and say that had to be God. So, Lord, we praise you and we thank you for, for all, of those, all of those things today. We give you praise and we give you glory for it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. One other quick thing, I just wanted to give you the details of the advertisement that I kept giving today. And uh, that is uh, the uh, Marriage by the Book workshop that Lisa and I are going to do. It's going to be uh, in July. It's going to be on two Tuesday nights. This is not going to be like a regular thing that we do every month, but July the 13th and July the 20th, starting at 6.30 each night. And uh, so we're going to take those two nights, and it's going to be a kind of an intensive time. We're going to cover a lot of things during those times, but we just felt like there was so much to cover that it would be hard to kind of put all those things into a few messages, especially if we're going to concentrate on family things, raising children, and those kind of things in the next few weeks on Sunday morning. So this is the way we're going to do this. So uh, we'll, we'll put out, within the next week or so, we'll put out a sign-up sheet so that we know how many is going to be here. And uh, I believe God's going to use it and do some good things through it. So if you know of anybody that wants to participate, it doesn't have to be people in the church. It can be anybody, you know. They just need to know it's, it's going to be uh, marriage by the book, the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, God, we just thank you for the day and the blessings that you've given us, Lord. Just be with us and go with us as we leave this place today. Let your hand rest upon us and let us be the people that you've called us to be in our marriage and our life. And we'll give you all the thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you today.